No, good morning, everybody. It is Christmas time, and don't tell anyone. That thing's streaming to all over the world, you know. But the cat's away, so the mice are going to play this morning. Let's have some fun, all right? We already have. We're just going to keep that going because it's Christmas time, and we're going to celebrate. Now, when we think of Christmas, and if the name Charles Dickens comes up, what do we instantly recall? Exactly, right? But I think his iconic first line to a tale of two cities fits the holidays really well, doesn't it? It was the best of times and it was the worst of times. My grandfather said, don't ever talk politics and religion at the dinner table, so don't. And you won't have the worst of times, right? <laughs> Just keep it, keep it where we can agree. But, um, but we're going to take a look at a tale of two stories today playing off of that. And the two stories, obviously, are the ones that got all of this started over 2,000 years ago. I found a really cool website preparing for this. It's called paragospel.com. And it puts the four Gospels, so the first four books of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, in column order and in somewhat of chronological order. So this is just a screenshot from the website showing the section on the birth of Christ. And what leapt off the page, I mean, we think about this, but then when you just see the visual, there really are two stories written by two authors, two different locations, two different places, two different casts of characters that we have really just combined into one in our typical Christmas story. We have the whole happy family at the manger scene, right? But there are some wonderful nuggets when we separate them and take a look at a tale of two stories. There certainly are. And some of those nuggets have to do with the consciousness that's woven into these stories. And today, that's what we would really like to focus on, are the, is the range of consciousness. So let's begin our tale of two stories with Matthew, who wrote to a Jewish audience in Jerusalem. A few of his king, uh, lead players were familiar with, King Herod, who was actually a Jew, appointed king by the Gentile government. So he was probably more of a political puppet but I'm just guessing having a nice palace to live in and the title king helped with that ego. And then, of course, there were the Magi who came from the east. Something often overlooked with the Magi are they were master astrologers and astronomers. They were well regarded for their metaphysical knowledge. So the ancient Magi were, like us, New Agers. They saw that star in their observations and were wise enough, pun intended, to connect, it with, to connect it with the Jews and traveled off to Jerusalem where they requested an audience with King Herod. Now, they were probably pretty excited about this news and thought Herod would be too. Maybe they over just kind of overlooked the fact that Herod was aging and they were asking him about his replacement. So we find ourselves <laughs> in King Herod's court. And the, and the Magi are asking, where is this child born king of the Jews? We saw his angel, we saw his star in the east, and we've come to worship him. King of the Jews? There's no other king of the Jews around here but me. And that's the way it's going to stay. This obviously is fake news. Why would these fools come to worship a baby instead of the real king? Scribes, Pharisees, come hither now. Do the prophets say anything about some baby being born king of the Jews? Something about a star? Hmm? Bethlehem, huh? All right, out. Now I'd better not take any chances with this one. It may not be fake news. I know what I'll do. I'll send them down to Bethlehem, and if they even find this baby, then I'll tell them to come back and tell me where he is so that I can go worship him or whatever. But really, I'll arrange to have him killed. Show them king of the Jews. Bah humbug! Well, is that how you expected this Christmas story to begin? <laughs> mm -hmm. 
So King Herod was those incredibly low level of consciousness. And since that's what we're really focusing on, let's bring up a maroon ring just as a visual aid to help anchor all of this consciousness. So all of that nasty, low stuff you just saw and heard in King Herod, kind of tie it to that maroon ring, and then we're going to come back later and look at that a little more closely. Can you imagine if that was our Christmas story? Come on, children, let's gather around. I'm going to tell you about the birth of Jesus. The Magi traveled to Jerusalem and met with King Herod, who was a lion narcissist. In fact, he was planning to... Of course we don't say that. We want a happy Christmas story, because I know that would not be the manger scene that I grew up with. But yet, it's really interesting that that is how Matthew starts his story of the birth of Jesus. He takes a very real part of humanity and has us look at it right off the bat. So what about that happy story that we're used to? We'll take our second story and our tale of two stories to Luke, who has that familiar opening for us. So as we know, the setting with Luke is a field where the shepherds are overlooking their sheep. And they're just hanging out, <laughs> relaxing, and suddenly <laughs> an angel of the Lord appears, and they were sorely afraid. Fear not. <laughs> Fear not. For I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be for all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this is the sign that you will have found the baby. He will be wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And they were joined by a multitude of heavenly hosts, saying... Glory to God in the highest, and on the earth, peace and love to each of you. Wow, can't you just feel the difference? Those low levels of Herod and the angelic, the angelic levels of consciousness. <laughs> it's just tangible. So as we used a maroon ring for the low levels, Let's use, well, of course, a golden ring for the angelic levels of consciousness. And all of that love and beauty will just kind of mentally tie to that ring. So what does this have to do with us and today and the holiday season? Well, we have those levels within us, just like the actor Thomas did, the high levels and the low levels and everything in between. But as we move into the holiday season, for some... It's a little more maroon. Not that we're choosing those nasty levels of King Herod, but life happens. And we suffer losses and loneliness, sometimes depression. And they're not by choice, but they're sure not pleasant. And no one likes to hang out there. You may very well know someone who is suffering these hurts right now. And this is a great time to send them some love and peace and healing energy. And then for, uh, for those people, this can truly be the worst times. And then on the other hand, for some, it is the best time of year. It is joy and family and laughter. And so much so, as soon as this holiday's over, they're starting to plan for next year. It is truly the best of times. So we were out and about recently, and we came across this towel that we thought summed both energies up beautifully. I have a couple of doctor friends in the house today, and we forgot to make an announcement, but Xanax stuffed turkey will be served in Fellowship Hall following this service. Honey, huh? that was the Wednesday before Thanksgiving. That had Xanax in it? It could account for the record number of pie sales. Well, then I guess I'd better tell you about some leftovers that are still in the fridge. Focus. Focus. Talk. <laughs> Let's look at this a different way. Because if we put the golden ring above the maroon ring, 
then we can clearly see that there are two distinct levels of consciousness and that one is definitely higher than another. But you know what that also is? That's, that's a picture of our human existence, isn't it? That's our life because don't we always wrestle in the realm in between those levels of consciousness? We came here to be in that struggle. And it is a struggle to work our way up from those low vibrations. And our poor King Herod didn't get it. And the sad thing is, the answer was standing right there in front of him. But he was so gripped in the paradigm of what is represented by that maroon ring that he couldn't see his way out. And what's even more ironic is that when we start to get some spiritual legs under us and we start to grow and we've been around here for a while and Sea Week is a great place to have that happen for us, but then it seems, doesn't it, sometimes that it's like, bam, something just comes along and knocks us right back into that now paradigm or subconscious programming that is our default mode of responding to and doing things. Right, and that can happen a lot, especially this time of year. But that's why Jesus came, to show us how to get from these low levels of consciousness up to the really high levels. And how did he do that? Well, he sparred with the religious leaders of that time. Metaphysically, they were the low levels of energy in fact, you could call them the Maroon Ring Fraternity Brothers of the time. <laughs> and then Jesus came in with a completely different paradigm. He was love and peace and forgiveness. And he even had a healing ministry. And today, we still call those miracles. But it's just that Jesus was at such a high level of consciousness that he could freely move between realities. Yeah. To Jesus, urns at a wedding feast could be filled with water in one reality, and in another reality, they could be filled with wine, the best wine. And because of his level of consciousness, he could just step from one reality to another as if they were existing side by side. We call that a miracle. But to Jesus, he was just moving, segueing from one state of being one reality to another. In Jesus' world, one could walk on water. In our world, obviously we cannot. But Jesus said that we have the kingdom of God within us. He said it in Luke, the kingdom of God is within. When we connect to that level of consciousness, then what else did he say? That we can do greater works than he did. Now that begs an interesting question. So why are we not seeing that kind of thing happen in our lives today? Well, for most of us, the collective consciousness is still very much governed by that maroon ring. But there is hope because we can talk to people who have transcended this dense earth um, atmosphere at times and they talk about feeling blissful and very enlightened and and just that ultimate love that we all crave and long for, but it's temporary, and then they end up coming back down, and this is what they have to deal with because this is where we are. However, if we would read down a little further in Matthew, we would come to the Sermon on the Mount, and that's where Jesus says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God. He's giving us some pointers here. Our whole purpose in this lifetime should be our spiritual development. It's all about the soul's journey. And when we look at our daily strife and all of those mountains that we have to climb and put it in that perspective, it's a completely different paradigm. Honey, I need to call an audible here. You've got the remote, and we need to change games. I'm trying to help you. <laughs> take it, take it. There we go. This uh, first slide that we're going to look at in wrapping up here is a quote that James gave us last week. 
So three little takeaways here as we wrap this up that can help us move from that maroon consciousness, that maroon energy, into that golden energy. So what's the first thing that we would do to take a big step, if you would, toward golden consciousness? It's the hardest thing in the world to do. It's nothing, right? We empty ourselves. And James mentioned this in the quote from Adyushanti last week, that when we empty ourselves from our ego, our little s, self, then the universe will always fill a vacuum, and it will fill that vacuum with love from capital S source. So as we empty out, we get filled with love. It seems like an odd paradox, doesn't it? But that's the way it works. And then the rest of the beautiful quote, the divine then becomes human, and the human becomes divine. This is the only holiday of the year that we celebrate for an entire month, isn't it? Rest or a day or maybe a weekend, but this is for the whole month. And we start it today on Advent Sunday. James sent this to me this week that I thought was just beautiful, the way that he put it couldn't be better. So I just wanted to say this. Advent is the traditional time of Christianity for preparing for the birth of Jesus. In the broader and more mystical view, it is taking the spiritual steps to remember and celebrate the indwelling Christ and to honor our way-shower who came to teach us who we really are. Wow, isn't that great? So this holiday season, for every bright light that you see on every tree, and every shining star, and every wreath, and bow, and package, and gift, and party, and everything that you do for this holiday season, do it focused on that golden consciousness, that beautiful, loving, selfless, empty, golden consciousness. This will be your best holiday ever, I promise you that. So another thing we can do is connect with that message of today, the first Sunday of Advent, the message of faith. Every major religion in the world talks about the importance of having faith. So it might be worth our time to spend a little time in contemplation thinking about where we put our faith. Do we put it in our own ego, which is really just our own unique way of clawing our way out of that maroon ring? Or do we put it outside of ourselves, even at sometimes, maybe in spiritual leaders or gurus, or looking for some new spiritual tools? Or do we bring our faith inside and put it in that capital S source? For when we do that and make that connection is when the human becomes divine. We have free will. You get to choose where you're going to put your faith. Where do you put it? And then finally, what is the greatest spiritual tool in our toolbox? I did an audiobook for Fred that was called The Miracles of Attention and Awareness. And he advocated, and boy, I've embraced this and it has made such a difference, that where we put our attention or our awareness expands. You know the quote, where we put our focus expands, right? It's the summary, it's the one sentence, the one phrase that sums up all of this. The law of attraction, all this is summarized in one sentence. What we focus on expands. The problem is that this system, again, is geared toward the maroon energy dragging us down. The gravitational pull is more toward the maroon. So when we leave here this morning and we go out there again, and somebody wants our little spot on, in the pavement while we're driving, right? Or that's the last large in the store, <laughs> and there are four of us that want it. And the emails start to click back in, and the texts and the phone messages, and all of that is bringing us more down. So we have to deliberately set our focus and put our attention and awareness 
on that beautiful higher consciousness. And when we do, that is our tale of two stories. So we would like to kind of take this into meditation. We would invite you to sit back, get comfortable, and cross your hands and your feet. Maybe put your hands in your lap or beside you. Close your eyes, and let's take a slow, deep breath in. And exhale. And another one. And I invite you to bring forth a mental image of that golden ring and place it upon, above your head. And just connect with all of the beautiful consciousness in that ring. Feel the love, the peace, the joy, all of the beauty. And let that flow down from the ring into you through your core. Let it flow throughout your body knowing that that consciousness is available to you at all times. It's a part of who you are. And as it is yours to receive, it is also yours to share. So as you send that same loving energy and radiate it from your body to the people next to you, to the church, to the greater community, and even onto the world. As we go into silence, visualize and feel how it, fe how it is to receive and to share that level of consciousness at all times. still have to continue on the journey. So I just went to bed, <laughs> covered my head, fell asleep for four hours, and then the phone rang, and it was James who called me, and I told him my concerns. And um, last Sunday, I know he told a lot of you that what, what I'd been mm -hmm. feeling. Um, and so he told me the feelings were normal, that I should allow myself a day of pity if that's what I need. Um, but to not, a not call a realtor and do not sign a lease and move in there because that you don't want to live there. But you can be there today, visit. So I did a lot of praying, a lot of soul searching, and then had a, had a visit with my doctor last week. And um, I was really shocked because I thought he would come in telling me, you know, I'm so sorry, you know, this is not what we had hoped for. This is not the result we wanted. But he was actually very jovial, very excited, and I thought, how dare you make light of the situation right now? I'm like sitting here dying, literally. And um, he said that he was excited because there were so many good things that showed up in the MRI that I actually overlooked. You know, sometimes we overlook the good when we see one thing that's bad, and um, it wasn't even bad. So he said that, yes, there's a new development. Yes, there's a new growth. But the beauty of an MRI treatment is that you can go down into the structure of the cellular level. And he said he didn't see any indication of, of cancer. It's just, it is what it is. It's a new growth that we'll watch over the next three months. 
every three months after that. And so, thank you. It's exciting. It's very exciting. So you're not going to get rid of me just yet. I know a lot of you probably were hoping and scheming. Aww, just kidding. Aw, no. No, but um, I asked the doctor, I said, so what should I do now? I mean, what's next? And he gave me the best advice that I've ever heard. And um, he said, you just need to laugh, love, and live your life. And I thought, that's awfully unity for a, for a man <laughs> who's never been to our church. I said, you need to come to my church. And so... Um, I will leave you with a quote that I learned from one of my favorite movies, which is Moulin Rouge, and it says, the greatest thing in life that we can learn is to love and be loved in return. And if love is all there is, that is way more than enough. So thank you, everyone, for your prayers, for your support. I love you all. Thank you.